my introduction to you was at that music festival, uh, uh, Durham Bulls uh, Stadium. Mm -hmm. Delta Ray is up playing, and they say, oh, we have a friend, Jason Adamo, who's going to come on and sing with us. Mm -hmm. And they'd already been playing a few songs and just you know, blowing away the stadium Power with their, yeah, vocals. their vocal power. And, um, and again, I thought, what kind of career suicide is this guy <laughs> doing to have to follow this? Yeah. Um, and here comes this guy with a, a, a Bill Murray baseball cap <laughs> onto the stage. And, but then I was so blown away by your voice. I'm like, I did not expect oh, thanks, man. that voice to come out. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> this guy deserves to be up on that stage. <laughs> he can that. hold his own. Appreciate that a lot. So, Especially amongst those guys. You know, that's a huge compliment. Yeah. And um, so now just to jump back in time, I'll get more with that. Mm -hmm. But when I was doing research on you, I found out that a lot of your, let's see, vocal education mm -hmm. came from busking in the subways That's of right. New York City. That's right, man. So what did you learn from that experience? Uh, how to project my voice. Yeah, it was um, before I started singing and busking in the subways, uh, I was a lot lighter of a singer, like a more breathy, mm -hmm. I would say, and I uh, just hadn't found my voice yet. And then I was like, I gotta get these people. It was awesome playing down there because there was a new crowd every five minutes. But I had to try to get every five minutes that crowd to turn around and listen to me and throw a couple dollars in my guitar case. Yeah. So I just learned with you know it's nonstop almost rattling of uh, train cars going by. Right. And you just figure out how to project based on that, based on trying to stand out amongst the the, the noise of the people and the trains and stuff. Mm. Before I knew it, and then also, you know, uh, literally listening to this guy, Martin Sexton, um, the way that like, that guy sang, I would, at the same, it was at the same time, it was about 2000, 2001, I was doing this in New York City. At the same time I was playing in the subways, my cousin gave me a burned CD mm -hmm. of his greatest hits, you know, and uh, at the same time I was busking, I was listening to that in my disc man back in the day, <laughs> and trying to sing along to this guy, so at the same time of projecting over the the noise of the subway um i was also trying to uh basically mimic the way that this guy was singing mm -hmm. and he's a guy who can really project his voice so right the two of those combined really helped me find uh, i couldn't sing like martin so mm -hmm. i had to try to find find my own voice yeah so i figured out how to sound a little bit more like my own but then self you know it's and then how would you explain because it's not just a case of i got louder you right. know because you could have had a, a mic and an amp and just always cranked it up. But it's, right. it's in this term, projection, I guess, would be it's it's power, it, but, you know, also feeling with it. I don't know. How would you describe? Well, speaking to the, the mic and the amp, I didn't have any of that stuff. I just had oh. my, my guitar. Some, some buskers will bring the whole, especially nowadays, they have like a cart and they have a mm -hmm. battery powering the amp and the, they have a whole setup and everything i would do it in my spare time like going to and from a job yeah um at, whenever i could i would just pop open the guitar case if uh, i always had my guitar with me too i was mm -hmm. one of those guys like, <laughs> there he goes yeah uh that's actually how i got uh to see eric clapton play at the garden i was walking down the street in new york city and this guy goes you play guitar obviously you're holding a guitar do you yeah. like eric clapton i said yes he goes <laughs> Here's two tickets to the garden. I can't go tonight. I said, "Wow, I'll take them." But I was that guy walking around with the guitar, so mm -hmm. you know, I just popped it open and 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 played. And that, without that microphone, I needed to really kind of learn how to project. Okay, and get I'm a little throaty with it. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm also curious, how did you learn to work a room from that? Because talk about <sighs> there are so many uh, bands that come up now, and and uh, you know, I've talked about this over and over again, but there's. One's on all those singing contest shows right. where they, they come on and they they become famous and then you see them out in the real world and they do not know how to work a room. I'm still not very good at it, believe it or not. Um, I was just discussing uh, with a few people bantering, like in between songs and mm -hmm. stuff. That's what I consider a working room, like keeping that connection with the artist and the audience. I'm more about connecting through just singing. Now, and I, in between songs, I'll be like, this next song is called blah, blah, blah. <laughs> then, then I'll talk about them out again. I was doing a, a radio thing the other day with QDR and uh, Mike Wheelis was like, 
you talk in this library voice and then I hear you sing and it's like it's two different people mm -hmm. but that's how it is like I, I'm very soft spoken most of the time when I get to play guitar and sing on the stage I kind of come more alive and stuff but yeah I'm still working on the whole witty banter between songs <laughs> but like I said I try to work the crowd with the music you know, the right band. but I mean you know I would think it would be also an, an, another massive education because you're you're plunked down in right. this place where they did not come to even hear music much less hear you yeah and it was so, annoying a lot of people at the same time. <laughs> so yeah I did I did learn how to um, interact with people uh, I was also 21 22 and very naive I was from uh, Southwest Virginia, a small college town in Virginia, living in New York City. It was like the biggest city on the, on earth, and it's, I was just like, I'm gonna come up there and play music. Yeah, right. you know, like, <laughs> I don't care who says what. I'm gonna keep playing. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I pissed off a couple of other buskers too because there was some territorial things no. going on in some of these subway stations. But I learned how to talk to them, and I learned how to talk to people because some people would want to come up and say, I really enjoy your music. Where can we? You know, yeah. hear more of it. And, uh, I learned how to network down there somewhat too. Mm -hmm. um, I learned how to hand out CDs and business cards, and I really started networking my for myself. Okay, so, okay. But I'm still a shy, soft-spoken dude. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it still. <laughs> and then, um, you know, one thing that stood out when I was reading through the bio uh, mm -hmm. uh, on the website, there was a, a line that said. Um, an interesting thing happens when a tight five-piece band of respectively talented musicians ditches gimmicks and masks. So that got me wondering, what were those gimmicks and masks that were ditched? That was written by a, a publicist that we had. Mm -hmm. um, she basically sent it to me to put in our bio many years ago, and it's been recycled throughout the years. But I think believe what she meant, um, her name is Laura Goldfarb. Okay. She's out of Los Angeles great um, publicist I've worked with many friends of mine over the years but I th believe what she meant was um, we weren't like we, we would go to play shows in LA in New York Nashville wherever but we weren't trying to look this look the, the current style and mm -hmm. whenever we were in these cities and we weren't trying to put on a front we were just trying to let our music do the talking you mm -hmm. know and we didn't coordinate outfits we didn't yeah. coordinate hairstyles you know, some, I mean, nothing against that, but uh, we were a little bit more of an organic kind of band that just gets up there and does our thing. Mm. And I think that's maybe what she was trying to say. Yeah. Um, she had us fill out a big history of our musical careers. Each okay. each band member um, put down everything relating to their music mm -hmm. like from kindergarten through, you know, now. And she took all, all of our answers to her questions and put, put it together in an EPK. No, okay. So, so it wasn't necessarily about you. I think it was about all of us. Um, I thought that was interesting that she said that as well. But I, I took what I took from it was that we were just trying to do our own thing and not trying to be the like one of the rest of the of the people in the entertainment. Industry, yeah, you know, or the bands that are out there currently. But I also I would also say that if you go through your music, it's 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 got an eclectic kind of sound. Definitely. There's yeah. some more soul, some more pop, some more country, and things like that. And has it always been your your guiding principle of all right, whatever the sound of the song is, just go with it? And yeah, you know, people ask us to describe um, what genre we are, and it's, I have a hard time doing that as well. Because, like I said, I was born and raised in Southwest Virginia. My parents were from Brooklyn and Queens, so even though I was around. Um, some country and bluegrass and stuff in Virginia. Um, I was listening to like Huey Lewis in the news, Billy Joel. My parents went to high school with Billy Joel. Oh. Um, stuff like that. And then I was introduced to Pearl Jam, mm. which opened the floodgates to Steve Ray Vaughan. And um, I was kind of sheltered growing up. I didn't hear about Led Zeppelin and all this stuff until I heard about Pearl Jam. And I started uh. researching who they listened to, mm -hmm. who Mike McCready listened to, or Stone Gossard listened to. They listened to Steve Ray Vaughan, they listened to Jeff Beck, they listened to all these people. And I started doing my research and mm -hmm. listening to that. So that kind of made its way into my music. The country-ish kind of surroundings made its way into my music. Um, collaboration with Doug and John Briggs kind of changed the, um, depending on what song we were working on at the time. Like yeah. Doug is a little bit older than us. Um, he was in a band in the DC area growing up. 
and their their style is a little bit more pop rock, mm -hmm. I would say, and uh, his his songwriting contribution kind of like dictated where we were going in that direction for this song or that song. Yeah, John Briggs was a little bit more of a '90s, uh, I would say, grunge mm -hmm. kind of fan, and he would he was producing at the time as well as playing bass in the band. Okay, and collaborating as, with songwriting as well. So once we did Transistor in 2010 and we opened up the floodgates to collaborating with each other, that's when our, our genres went all over the place. Before that, I was a little bit more on the, the soulful, like um, yeah. trying to be a Martin Sexton type mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. artist with the blue-eyed soul thing and uh, collaboration opened the, the gates to uh, just sounding different. You know? Yeah, yeah. And exploring different types of music too. And then moving to Nashville, of course, I... S <laughs> explore deeper into the country sound yeah yeah well i mean you know i mean speaking of that um you know i found it fascinating the the story of how you and brett young wrote the beautiful believer song right that was on his album mm -hmm. uh to give a brief synopsis essentially there was another songwriter who was you know it was a number one party for uh, uh one of his tunes right. he talked about uh, you know, his wife always believing in him, even when he was, you know, yeah. doing absolutely nothing. You guys had a songwriting session scheduled for the next day. That's right. And it immediately clicked, oh, this is what we have to write about. It clicked at the party the night before, actually. It was John Knight, who was one of the songwriters for a David Nail song, Whatever She's Got. Mm. And um, for those people who don't know, in Nashville, the publishing companies will throw a number one party any time one of their writers has a number one hit. And David Neal, was, he got up there and he performed the song. He's like, thanks for, thanks y'all for being here, but I didn't write this song. <laughs> Introduced John Knight and another artist, another songwriter who wrote the song. And they both just gave, like you said, a speech. John's was very memorable. His wife and his 16-year-old daughter were standing right in front of him. Mm. And he said, he told the whole story about, you know, my wife kept telling me, if we're going to be poor, we're going to be poor, but we're going to stay in Nashville until you become a hit songwriter. And he looked at her and he said, you know, She's my beautiful believer, and Brett and I literally looked at each other and were like, that's what we're writing about tomorrow. Mm. And then we brought in our friend, um, Annie Wilgen, and we co-wrote the song the next day, um, the three of us. Now, I'm curious, though, the moment when you guys, you know, locked eyes and like, okay, that's it. As a songwriter, did your mind, like, start working on it immediately and, like... Not yet. No? Um, usually that, for me at least, that, that all starts happening in the room the mm -hmm. next day. Because you don't know what Annie Wilson wasn't there, so we had to tell her exactly what what happened uh, based on, you know, kind of a foggy memory of that before. Yeah, so it was a couple of drinks involved. <laughs> but um, we remembered that he would. They were from, you know, um, they were poor. They were going to be poor until he uh, made it big, according to her. Mm. Um, if they had to live in a, they were living in a hotel in this beach. I think in the beginning, um, they were, they moved to like it, the the song lyric says they rolled in town at only eighteen. Yeah, they lived in a in a motel at first to get started in Nashville with a newborn baby. Um, super poor, mm -hmm. he's trying to do what he could play on Broadway and play. I think he said he busked as well. Yeah, and doing whatever he, he could. So we took those little tidbits that he threw out in the speech, kind of made up the rest. You know, mm -hmm. we figured out uh, the hotel was on a, a street called Main Street, which we all pulled out our phones was like is there even a main street in nashville <laughs> and we saw one in east nashville we're like yes <laughs> we didn't know where the motel was okay so there's a, a bit of um uh, fabrication i guess yeah uh, or just like uh creativity thrown on to his story uh, yeah trying to figure out where the story goes you know and then i mean how did how do well i'm wondering how do three people write a song together is it you know someone kind of is more in charge of the melody someone's more in charge of the lyrics or for that particular it's different for forever right um in my experience in that experience it was uh, brett and i had our acoustic guitars and annie was just sitting there on the couch and whenever we we were both kind of come up with the chords we were all three of us kind of come up with the melody based on the chord changes we were coming up with at the time and it was mostly line by line to where um, rode in town at only 18 and then Brett would come up with my girl beside me and our baby in a car seat mm. and then we're like oh that sounds good let's go with that um, what what happens next so well, everybody called me crazy you know 
but that was fine as long as she believed. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, I believe the three of us just started piecing, you know, line by line, the rest of the song together. Yeah. Um, somebody would come up with a line, we're like, oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. And then we'll play off of that line with the next one. Yeah. And then <laughs> was uh, John Knight, I think you said his name is, was he text that you wrote a song about his wife before he could get one out like that? I mean, <laughs> you know what? You stole so his he, story. So. so I, I was uh, I was wondering if you'd ever hear it. <laughs> sure enough, Brett got signed to Big Machine um, okay. label group for his first record in 2017, which that song appears on. And one of the main writers for that label group is John Knight. <laughs> so also on that first album, there's a couple of songs with John Knight that Brett wrote. Oh, okay. So it's a f kind of a full cir circle moment where yeah. one of the songs is about John on the same album as Brett's writing with John. Two mm -hmm. other songs, I think, yeah. two or three other songs. And um, w during that process, he heard Beautiful Believer, and he was just blown away, Brett said. And um, I've actually chatted with John through Instagram a couple times about it. Okay. And it, that song really means a lot to them. Okay. And I thought that was super cool. Yeah. Um, actually, what's even cooler, I think, is um, if, you, if you're if you in the Brett Young fan club, they call themselves Beautiful Believers. Yeah. So that's even cooler. Yeah, yeah. definitely. That song has, has taken on its own kind of life. Mm-hmm. And then sticking with songwriting, but moving uh, um, back to your solo stuff, mm -hmm. um, the the tune Raleigh Nights, um, right. which uh, isn't it, again another one of those songs, uh, I think should have been a total hit, uh, oh, and it still could be. It's one of the hookiest things you know I've I heard in a while. Um, but and one thing that jumped out at me, there was the, the one line in there of uh, a blonde-haired girl mm -hmm. who smelled like. A Saturday in June, <laughs> which I love, and it says so much. And I'm curious, with lines like that, how much of it is inspiration and how much of it is perspiration? How much of it is, <laughs> you know, the muse whispers in your ear, and how much of it is, ah, this was word isn't quite right. I gotta, I gotta work on this. Well, to answer that, we need to bring my brother Chris Adamo. In. Ah, so Chris is a, a heck of a poet and. When we were doing Transistor, uh, he sent me a bunch of poetry, and one of which was a, a, a very long poem called Raleigh Nights. It was about a drunken night at the Poor House Music Hall. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's New Year's Eve, I believe, because he's well, stumbling around. The song around starts off New, New Year's, Year's Day. Day yeah. yeah, I wasn't there, but he, uh, okay. he, from what he could remember, he told me about the night. Yeah, and then I, I kind of took his very long poem, took a lot of the, um, the paragraphs out, down mm -hmm. to make it a turned in a little bit more of a song form, song yeah. lyrics, and I added the uh, the chorus, Take Me Home, It's All Right. And I think we uh, massaged a couple of the other lines that he wrote, but that was one of my favorite lines. Um, and it's actually a, a California girl, because my brother lived oh. in California, and we switched it to Carolina. Because <laughs> it's Raleigh Nights, after yes, all. Yes, right, right. Um, that's what we did when we massaged a couple of lines. Mm -hmm. um, just another one of those Raleigh Nights, you know. He he was combining his experience out in California with, I guess, the woman that he was talking about, he missed, mm. um, or the story, the part of that song is about a, a girl in California. Yeah. The rest of it is a drunken night in Raleigh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe some regrets about that girl in California. Right, right. Um, but, um, yeah, so Chris sent me, actually three of his poems turned out to be songs on Transistor. Okay. Including Raleigh Nights. Yeah. But that song, uh, you know, I appreciate you saying that it's locally it, it was we would call it our hit you know yeah. ar around this area the carolina hurricanes used to play it at their uh, home games mm -hmm. every time they lost which was for a couple seasons a lot no oh. uh, back in 2010 and 11 or 12 and um and then recently as last year it was in a, a movie called raleigh i kind of like you hmm. that was uh you can find it on amazon prime okay uh, okay they used that uh, on the soundtrack yeah so, but, and then, how did the melody come about for that one? That, that was all me or the band in the studio. Okay. You know, um, actually, so, come to think of it, when I first put the melody to it, it was more of a, like a rock song. And that, then we decided to do a record with a producer, John Briggs, who I spoke about earlier. And John did not really like that song. Oh. He was like, I don't think he liked the way it sounded as a rock song. He was like, I don't know, man. I just need something. And so I started playing it with a country twang in the studio. Mm -hmm. Take me home. <laughs> it's all right. He goes, if you sing it like that, I'll put it on the record. <laughs> and we're like, well, no, let's put sing it like that and we'll put it on the record. 
and it kind of you know took off from there but yeah yeah um but it's just one of those it's got uh, what do they call the earworm aspect to it you know it does uh, have a catchy hook to yeah, it. yeah yeah um, it's, it's fun having people at the show sing along to that one mm-hmm. you know, people who know it yeah and then we'll just let them sing that at the very end just another one of those boom yeah and they'll sing Raleigh nights and especially um in Raleigh when we sing, when yeah, we yeah. And the other night we did a Durham night, so I don't know if you caught that. No, yeah, I heard you throw that in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then moving forward in time uh, uh, to your most recent Looking Glass album. Yeah. Um, well, one thing when I was going through your interviews and you were talking about the whole album wraps around two rather momentous events in your life. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, the passing of your mother, and two, the birth of your daughter. Mm-hmm. I think daughter. My oldest daughter, yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing it made me think of was it was that concept, or I don't know. I know it actually happened to you, but did it? It made me think of the live song "Lightning Crashes." Oh yeah. Oh, you're talking about the one for Brooklyn? Um, no, just the whole concept of, of the album. Of the album. Oh, okay. Just because that song is uh, the lightning crashes is, is about one woman dying and right. another woman giving birth. I and, see. I see. Where and the same out. angel presiding over right, right. both events. And so, uh, not that your sounds like their lightning crashes. Right. Right. But I'm trying to think. So, um, over the moon. Yeah. Which is definitely about Brooklyn, and so that happened. We had Brooklyn before my mom passed. Okay. But my, my, but Brooklyn was eight months old when my mom passed. When I wrote the concept of that song, or the idea of that song, or the demo of that song, I don't think my mom even, or I don't think, I don't think we knew she had cancer at that point. Oh. Um, so that it was very roller coastery of a year, if that mm. makes sense, or a couple of years. So, boom, I have a, my first child, elated. Short, really shortly thereafter, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. And then she's cancer-free for a little bit, and then cancer comes back. By the time she passes, Brooklyn's eight. Now we have Chloe as well. A whole other story. But all of this is happening while I'm trying to write a, a new record. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a couple of song ideas still floating around about Brooklyn. The only one that really made it on the record is Over the Moon. Mm-hmm. Looking Glass happened between Doug and I. We wrote that song. Um, shortly after my mom passed. It was based on some dreams that my, uh, I'm one of five kids, and all my siblings, and I think my dad too, were visited by my mom in dreams shortly oh, wow. after she passed, and I was not at mm-hmm. that point. And the, the song is basically about, Mom, come visit me in my, in my, in my dreams, like you're visiting everybody else. Um, but until then, until you do, I'm gonna keep, my mom wrote, she kept a journal, she wrote a lot of emails to us, uh, the chorus is like, I'll keep reading the words you wrote down. Yeah. You know, it really helps me get through this time until I see you again in my dreams. So, um, the looking glass, that whole song came about wishing my mom into my dreams. And then eventually she started visiting me in my dreams. Mm. Um, that, that song was the catalyst to really put the rep, the record out. And I was like, let me see what else I got in the demo vault. Yeah. And I had over the moon and I had uh, take care of you, which is about my wife and I, um, trying to have kids. We had uh, fertility issues as well. Mm-hmm. So it's a, as Doug Castine, my guitar player, put it in a, another interview, it was like a, it was a love letter to my family. Yeah. In many different aspects. To my dad, there's Brooklyn, Lisa, my wife, and one to my mom, which turned out to be the title track. Yeah. Is it harder to write about something that personal, or is it harder to write about things you weren't involved in? Personally? Probably probably weren't involved in. Okay. Um, Personally, that's it's very cathartic for me to write about uh, loss or love or whatever's happening to me in my life. Mm. That's where I find my inspiration, and it's usually starts flowing a lot easier when I'm writing mm. um, if it's personal. Uh, in songwriting sessions with other people, it's good because we're collaborating with somebody else who probably it's flowing. It's probably flowing better for them. Yeah, especially if we're writing a song based on a story they just told me mm-hmm. happened to them. And I'll just kind of help them piece it together. Yeah. And I'm just kind of like the utility player, and like comes in and, oh, well, what if the melody did this, or what if this line said that? 
uh, or maybe this is what you're trying to say, mm -hmm. and it's less personal for me. Um, that's also a great experience too, but for me, the best experience is putting down my feelings onto paper or in my phone or on my computer. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, um, and that's very easy for me. I, I was writing poetry before I started writing songs when I was a little kid. Okay, yeah, dumb stuff like, "Do you really love me?" Oh, <laughs> like a little love, love poem for yeah imaginary girls that I hadn't even met yet. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, per and personal vibe for me is where it's at. So right, I mean, right. Okay, and then also made me think of. I mean, have you ever d d really delved into the the lyrics of Robert Hunter? Um, I haven't. Uh, because he wrote a lot of the Grateful Dead tunes. Oh, okay. And, um, you can you can get this book. Um, I think it's called The Box of Rain, which is his compiled lyrics. And oh, okay. there's a Grateful Dead song called The Box of Rain, mm -hmm. which Phil Lesh he wanted a song to sing to his dad, who was who was you know uh, didn't have many days left, right, and so right. Robert wrote A Box of Rain. See, for, I didn't know that they had somebody helping them out with the songs. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, and it's but. I'll definitely have to check if that If you out. dig into Looking Glass, you know, your lyrics, and you dig into Box of Rain and stuff, and mm -hmm. it's, um, I don't know, there's, it's, it's, it just reminds me that, like, music and songs can tackle these really massively difficult oh, yes. things definitely. that are, I don't know, through metaphor and stuff, you can say much more than you can if you were trying to directly explain how you're thinking and feeling. Right, definitely. I'll have to check that out because... Yeah, that's the kind of songwriting I really appreciate, too. Mm -hmm. um, like Doug Castine, my lead guitar player, one of our other songs that we play at almost every show is called King of Dock Street. It's about the loss of his dad. And it's really like the best, I hate to say the best inspiration is losing somebody, but you're feeling all these emotions and uh, for artists and for songwriters, it's it's what we live to do, you know? Yeah, it's like, yeah. oh, finally, because sometimes... Especially living in Nashville, you know, people are writing and writing and writing. I'm not that type of writer. I, I write when stuff comes to me. Okay. And inspiration will have to come to me whether it's having a child or mm -hmm. trying to have kids or losing a parent, you know. That kind of stuff is, you know, monumental in your life and it's, you can't help but start feeling something about it. Yeah. You know, and like I said, it's great for me to, to put it down yeah. on paper. Now, the other thing that... Um the story of that album that really hits uh, uh, emotionally is album cover is an image of a butterfly mm -hmm. and you had them draw your mother's eyes into the wings of the butterfly. Yes, George Hodge from Jack the Radio, uh, another Raleigh band. He's a phenomenal artist in the area. Um, without knowing the story that my four siblings and my dad and I have started seeing all these monarchs butterflies that week of my mom's passing mm -hmm. um, he gave me six different options to choose from for the album cover like just pencil drawings mm -hmm. and one of which was a butterfly with eyes on it and I was like Oof, and I got goosebumps then I'm getting them now I was like that's that's the one right there and if you could could I send you a couple pictures of my mom and reshape the eyes to look mm -hmm. like my mom's and he was like absolutely so that's the t-shirt that's the koozie that's yeah, whatever, yeah. Any, Anytime somebody buys the record, they're taking um, a you know, little piece of my mom home with them. And then, I'm curious, from your perspective, what do those eyes in the album cover convey? Ooh, that's a tough question. My, my mom's anniversary of her death was um, the 6th of July, two days oh, ago. Mm, we were just at, uh, thanks. We were just at Oakwood. We, every year we uh, hang out around her grave and we have a picnic and stuff. And... Uh, so right now, this week, that the emotions are very raw still. Yeah. Um, just thinking about, you know, the love that came out of those eyes, really. She had five kids. Um, we, didn't have a lot of, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. She did what she could um, to make our lives the best they could be. And mm -hmm. She was such a sweet lady. She could, you could, you could read what was going on with, with her through her eyes, you mm -hmm. know very kind gentle soul and her eyes really uh, represented that well yeah yeah gorgeous blue green eyes too by the way okay because yeah the change. cover is they would change cover is black and, right. and kind of a silver bit of a ring around it and there's imagery wise it's kind of it hits you a little intense mm -hmm. in terms of the colors 
but yet the eyes are kind of soft. Yeah. You know, and so. Yeah, I wish I could uh, A and B the two two eyes. You know, the two drawings for you. Yeah. To, to show you George's work, to where he he changed them. Mm -hmm. Somewhere I had them on my, on my computer, I'm sure. But yeah, he really did uh, represent my mom's eyes. Really mm -hmm. well with that. Yeah, I, I I often wonder what people think about that when they see the, those eyes on that butterfly. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, and then, I don't know, I guess it's suppose it's the same thing as people interpreting song lyrics, and it's, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I've spoken to a number of musicians who refuse to tell people what songs are about a lot <laughs> of the time, just because they, they don't want to ruin whatever that person feels right. or experiences mm -hmm. from it, and so. Um, yeah, I'm, I can understand where some songwriters are like that, but uh, I kind of appreciate, I, I'm dying to know what some of my favorite songs are about, you know, so mm -hmm. when people ask me about that. Um, I usually tell them exactly what I was thinking when I wrote it. Yeah. And a lot of times they're like, whoa, I didn't even think that. There's one song I wrote called Foundation, which was uh, something I wrote during the, my, I was previously married, and we were separated at the time, and it's it's kind of about, you know, what what we need to be together, to stay together as a stronger foundation. Yeah. And a lot of people would email me saying, hey, can I use that for my wedding and stuff? I'm like, did you, are you listening to the lyrics? <laughs> Because it's actually about divorce, so <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I was like, sure, do whatever. Right. <laughs> but, you know, it's not about, you know, it's not a happy ending, that song. Yeah, no. yeah. No, that's like, uh, yeah. So, like couples in the 80s that had uh, uh, R.E.M.'s The One I Love is their oh, song. Yeah. It's like, right. have you listened to the lyrics, right. you know, especially right. the ones that say another prop to occupy my time? Yeah. This is not a good couple <laughs> tune. Some people will pick and choose the lines out of a song, and then it'll become their favorite song based on those lines. And right. What they think it means. So you know, yeah, that, that's cool if that's what they want to do. Yeah. Now the other the other worst scenario I've ever heard about that was was back in the '90s. Um, Billy Idol made an appearance on the Tonight Show, mm -hmm. and um, we a friend's wedding was coming up soon. My dad had caught the show seen it on television and said oh you know did you see this billy idol guy mm -hmm. before and i said yeah i did and he said he said that white wedding song would be good to play at, at, at sharon's wedding i'm like that's not a song you, i know it has wedding in the title right, but right, no right. no that's that's when you have that i miss the the physical copies of the albums with the song lyrics in it yes so you can Maybe decipher a little bit more what they're talking about in the song. Yeah. Instead yeah. of just like, oh, white wedding, yeah, that sounds good. Right, right. Let's see what else he's talking about in that. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget, I saw um, the night before he did Storytellers, Billy Idol. Mm. He came into the club I was working at in Manhattan, the bottom line, and it just blew the roof off the joint mm. and, and as a rehearsal for Storytellers. Oh, wow. And played that song. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Um... Another thing uh, I was wondering about is you uh, you were in Nashville for a few years mm -hmm. and by all accounts doing quite well when you write a song that you know ends up on an album that goes platinum mm -hmm. um, what brought you back to North Carolina I was already moved back to Raleigh in a movie theater watching a movie with my brother Chris who co-wrote Raleigh Nights when Brett texted me saying I got a record deal and Beautiful Believer is going to be on the first album. So, oh, wow. A lot of times, songs take a long time to get onto a record. So, right. Um, you know, I was, before COVID, I would go back there and play shows and write and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I still will Zoom write with artists, with songwriters there. Um, it wasn't, like I mentioned earlier, the whole songwriting process there is not something I vibed with. It was a nine-to-five job. It was like punching a clock. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to write with this person and this person from two to five or two to four mm. and from one to or 12 to two we're going to write with these two people yeah no matter what inspiration is hitting us that day no matter what mm -hmm. um that's not and i we successfully wrote a few songs mm -hmm. that way which so it can be done in my world but like i said i prefer to do it when inspiration hits and sometimes that's at 3 a.m when you can't sleep yeah and there's nobody else to help you write the song mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know um i wasn't really it's a great great city filled with amazingly talented artists it really kind of helps you step your game up a little bit on the songwriting world the singing world everybody there is as good as you if not better and it's great it's just like if you're playing a five on five basketball and the, yeah the people you're playing with are a lot better than you 
if you keep playing with those people, you're going to get better. So I appreciated that aspect of living there. My liver did not appreciate living there <laughs> because networking yeah. involves a lot of shots of whiskey and yeah. stuff. And, um, which happened a, lo a lot of times where I was out at a bar one night, mm -hmm. hanging out with so-and-so and doing a shot, and the next day, like for instance, one night I'm hanging out at Whiskey Jam at Winners in Nashville, and I'm hanging out with um, the former guitarist for Kid Rock, and we're okay. just doing shots. Oh. And he's like, well, what are you working on now? I was like, I'm working on a, an album, blah, blah, blah. He's like, I'll play guitar on it. So the next day, he came over to our studio and laid wow. down some tracks, some guitar tracks on it. And that's because I was hurting my liver the night before. Yeah. Right, we, the next day, we got a great take or two from um, from the guy who played wow. guitar for Kid Rock yeah. for many years. Okay. So it was, it was, I learned a lot, let's just say that. Right. I learned a lot about networking. And uh, in my older age, I don't network the same way anymore. Right. But... Um, it's a fun city to go back to, and now that I have a, a network of people that I can write with, um, I can either do it over Zoom or I can just go back there for a short trip yeah. and write and and go there for that specifically and not mm. like try to live there and set it up as I'm going night night from night, meeting people and networking the way I did back then. Yeah. So I also recommend the Red Door. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to that place, it's filled with if you if you are up on the side musicians mm -hmm. it's filled with amazing talent sitting around that bar oh yeah i mean um, almost any any bar that has music yeah you'll never know who you're going to see that night like one night we're at a pizza joint and ryan adams's pedal steel guitar player is playing a side gig oh wow and i was like this guy's phenomenal who's it and i was like that's ryan adams's yeah pedal steel. <laughs> oh, that makes sense and this you go down on broadway and you see people who tour with dolly parton and stuff and yeah right it's right it's crazy um, and then just to bring things full circle, so um, uh, your your work with, with Delta Ray and uh, uh, the times they've opened for you, you've opened for them and such. And also, um, you've done a lot of onstage collaborations with uh, Elizabeth Hopkins mm -hmm. from, from Delta Ray. And, you know, yet another person with a, a, a killer voice. Um, Incredible. You know. I'm curious though, what makes her so good to sing with? You know, what makes it the two of you work so well together? She um, has an incredible amount of soul in her voice, and that's what I strive to be a soul singer, you know, as much as I can be. And her proximity to the city of Raleigh. <laughs> <laughs> She's the only member of Delta Ray that still lives in the Raleigh, the Triangle area. Oh, ah, okay. And they have uh, Eric in New York and. Mike and Grant in the Nashville area, and Ian's down in uh, Florida. Oh, okay. So, uh, Liz still lives in the area, and if she's in town and they're not touring, and we're playing a show, I always invite her out. If she can make it, great. If she can't, you know, mm -hmm. it's cool. Yeah. Uh, she'll be there. Um, I'm not sure when this is going to air, but she's going to join us at the Lincoln Theater for my annual birthday bash this weekend, because um, she's in town, and she loves singing with my band, and I love singing with her. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, she's it's just a, a soulful connection. Or that's that's people like the way that Liz Hopkins sings are the people I love listening to. Yeah, uh, people who really put not that and everybody else in Delta Ray doesn't put forth mm -hmm. like they all have amazing vocals, but the amount of soul um, in Liz, I, I really appreciate. Yeah. Uh, people like, I grew up listening, once I found out about this music, I listened to a lot of Motown, Marvin Gaye. And mm -hmm. If you ever go up, check out Liz's playing around town in Raleigh on the side now, um, she'll do some anywhere from Aretha Franklin to, you know, um, I believe this weekend she's going to sing Ain't No uh, Mountain High Enough. Oh, wow. Um, you know, with my buddy Michael George's. She's a great Motown type soulful singer. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about her. And then, speaking of Soulful, you, uh, there's, and, and there's now videos of you out doing that, and what I saw you perform at that music fest was the song, uh, What You Thinking About, Baby, yep. which you said you basically uh, acquired from them, <laughs> um, but it, it fits you and your voice really well, you know, in, in that kind of, again, just that, that blue-eyed soul kind right. of vibe. Well... I remember hearing it um, at one of their shows first, and then I believe 2019 um, I filled in for Ian. He couldn't make this uh, concert at Pac uh, NC State called Packapalooza, mm -hmm. and it's where they block off Hillsborough Street. Got a big stage and everything, 
And one of the songs that he wanted me to sing in his place was What You Think About Baby. So he sent me the demo of that mm -hmm. to learn it. And I was like, whoa, this isn't Delta Ray. I mean, it doesn't sound like Delta Ray. I know it's yeah. Ian singing. I know it's Eric playing keys, but didn't match the rest of their sound, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, when I sang it at the Packapalooza thing, I really was trying to sing the way that Ian sang on the demo. And he also sang it in a higher key. Uh -huh. So it was very difficult to hit some of these higher notes that he's used to hitting. When I started trying to sing it more, I, after I learned it, I started singing it with my band. And when first thing I did was drop the key, <laughs> so I could I could hit the notes that I wanted to hit. Yeah. And um, I put it kind of try to put my own twist on it with my own soulful kind of twist, like I said. And when I came up with the idea for that, um, I ran it by Ian. He loved the idea of me of my voice being on one of his songs, you mm -hmm. know? And so I wanted to make sure that I did it justice, but still put my own kind of twist on it. And uh, they were all very happy with it. They yeah. were all very happy with the fact that um, that that station was playing it a lot, too, mm -hmm. in the Raleigh area. So, and then, full circle, we sang it a couple weeks ago at uh, the Durham Bulls Athletic Park together. Yeah. And I sang it. They played it their way, but I and Doug jo Castine joined on guitar. Yeah. Uh, we played the solo on our version of it, so he played the solo at the music fest, and I kind of sang it my way, mm -hmm. the lead part at least. Yeah, so, yeah. That was a lot of fun. That was a very memorable moment from that weekend. Yeah, and it's it's a fabulous song to hear coming out of those massive speakers they had on the main yes. stage too. It's always so. a joy uh, singing in front of that many people and playing and singing through a PA system like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, that takes care of all my questions. Is there anything we didn't cover? that you want to talk about? Mm, not much. You know, uh, my band is playing around town. Um, we're not touring as much as we used to, but uh, we'll be playing at the Lincoln Theater soon, in the Poor House in October, and um, Lazy Days in Cary sometime this summer. I'm not sure of the date. Mm -hmm. But look for us around town. Okay. We'll be, we'll be around. Cool. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Oh, yeah. My pleasure. Appreciate thanks. It.